Truth Triumphant by B.J. Wilkinson Chapter 6 Vigilantius, Leader of the Waldenses The paganism which so soon begun to to, began to go avenge itself by creeping into the doctrines and practices of the early church has never been altogether eradicated, and it has always been ready to become the nucleus of heresy or corruption when faith declined, when faith declined or ardor cooled. The, early, the earliest leader of the prominence, uh, prominence among the noble Waldenses in northern Italy and southern France is Vigilantius, A.D. 364 to 408. By some, he has been accounted as the first supreme director of the Church of the Waldenses. In his time, the protests against the introduction of pagan practices into Christianity swelled into a revolution. Then it was, through the th it, then it was th that the throngs who desired to maintain the faith once delivered to the saints in northern Italy and southwestern France, were welded into an organized system. Desiring truth based on the Bible only, those who refused to follow the superstitious novelties being brought into the church were greatly influenced by the clear-cut scriptural teaching of Vigilantius. Undoubtedly, Patrick of Ireland, who was at the same time enlarging the Irish church, was stirred by the reforms taking place in the south of, in South Central Europe. Vigilantius was born in southern France near the Pyrenees Mountains. His father was the proprietor of a relay post, a Mancio, one of those many traveling stations throughout the Roman Empire. The early home of the reformer was a relay center where the change of horses could be secured for travelers who, perchance, were merchants, ambassadors, illustrious personages, bishops, ordinary tourists, or imperial courtier, courtiers. The business offered the growing youth abundant opportunity to maintain information on all topics from those who carried his father's mountain abode. As Vigilantius ranged through the sol solitudes tending the flocks, pursuing the chase, or guiding, seller, su guiding travelers through the mountain defiles, de he increased in stature and wisdom. Sometime while in contact with the Christian travelers, he accepted Christ as his savior. Nearby were the, sta the estates of the famous historian Sulpius, Sulpicius Severus. This renowned writer was the idol of the learned class. In his mansion, he was at some times host for practically all the distinguished men of his day. He invited Vigilantius to enter his employ, first probably in ordinary service, but later as collector of rents and a manager of his estates. While Vigilantius was employed in the services of this historian, a great change came over Sulpicius Severus. He was carried off his feet by the wave of asceticism and monasticism which was sweeping westward. Vigilantius early learned to love his employer. He admired greatly the brilliant intellect of this man who could feed the hungry, clothe the poor, visit the sick, while engaging in many literary labors. The struggle against monasticism. Now, not too far to the north dwelt Martin, Bishop of Tours. Near the banks of the Lior River, this prelate had founded the first monastery in France. The extreme austerities of asceticism to which he had subjected himself, coupled with the flaming reports of his so called miracles, enabled him to set. Loose in the West, the passion for monastic life. Sulpicius, Sulpicius Severus, accompanied by Vilantius, his Celtic financier, sent out to visit Martin. That conference produced a profound change in the life of both Sulpius and Vigilantius, but in opposite direction. The fanaticism of Martin, Bishop of Tours, drew Sulpicius and his brilliant talents into the monastic life. Such were the scenes related to Vigilantius by Sulpicius if not actually witnessed by him, and he could not remain blind to the fact that his patron was neither happier nor better for his visit to the Bishop of Tours. After his return home, the image of Martin haunted the sensitive historian. He was pursued by the recollection of the ascetic prelate <coughs> sleeping on the cold earth, with nothing but ashes stewed beneath him, and covered with only with sackcloth, refusing a softer bed or warmer clothing even in severe illness declaring that a Christian ought to die on ashes, 
feeding on the most unwholesome food and denying himself every indulgence, praying in the most irksome posture, forcing sleep from his eyes, and exposing himself to the extremes of heat and cold and hunger and thirst. The imagination of Sulpicius dwelt on what he had seen and heard at, at Marmelotier, until he believed that heaven would be closed upon him unless he should practice the same austerities. The love of the marvelous, the habit of dwelling upon tales of wonder and practicing ascetic austerities, had seized the employer of Vigilantius. On the other hand, Vigilantius saw in the system a form of religion without the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. Thus, Vigilantius saw on the one side vainglorious exaltation, spiritual pride, and pretension to miraculous power, and on the other side a false humility and prostration of both understanding both growing out of the same mistaken system of asceticism, a system which undermined the doctrine of Christ's full and sufficient sacrifice, and assigned an undue value to the afflictions and performances of men like Martin of Tours, and he probably foresaw, and he and which he probably foresaw would in the end elevate them in the minds of weak brethren, to mediatorial thrones and render them less than little less than the objects of divine worship. Consequently, we must attribute, the impression, attribute to the impressions first received in the house of Salphysius the efforts which Vigilantius afterward made to expose the errors of asceticism and to check the progress of hagiolatry. The gulf between Vigilantius and Salphysius, which was formed by their visit to Martin, was widened when Salphysius employed him as a messenger to the Paulinus of Nola, Italy. This excellent man had also done a great gone to a retreat where he could give his name, give his time to those beguiling practices which afterwards became the characteristics of the Latin church, and proved so fatal in the end to the simplicity of the gospel. Religious observances, transferred upon pagan altars to Christian shrines, were dignified with the name of honors due to the memory of a departed saint. And as heroes of the old were invoked by the ancestors of pa the ancestors of Paulinus, so did he himself substitute the name of Felix for that of Hercules or Quirinius, and implore the aid of the dead martyr when no other name in prayer ought to have been on his lips than that of the mediator between God and man. Furthermore, we are told that Pope Gelasius in the fifth century introduced into the West the purification festival coupled with a procession of lights to the supplement of the heathen feast Lupercalia. What, we have been, uh, what must have been the effect upon our simple mountaineer when he beheld in Italy gorgeous shrines erected to the commemorate hermit? Through divine grace, Vigilantius escaped the infatuation, which descends almost, irresi almost irresistibly upon those who yield themselves to the practices designed to supplant the simplicity of the gospel. The age of the apostles faded away into the age of the church fathers. Learning and argument were used to prove the verities of the gospel rather than the words which the Holy Ghost teacheth. This was especially true of Europe and Africa. Revolt against asceticism and monasticism. As if the ransom of the Redeemer was not sufficient without their own sufferings, those who practiced asceticism imposed appalling torments upon themselves. They undermined the, the, they undermined the doctrine of Christ's full and sufficient atonement for sin. Processions were formed, relics displayed, and, in, and incense burned before the tomb of some exalted ascetic. Monasticism followed on the heels of asceticism. Justin Martyr, A.D. 150, was prominent among the early apostates because of his perverted teachings. He was followed by his tuper, by his pupil Tatian, who in turn taught Clement, A.D. 990, a founder of the ecclesiastical school at Alexandria. Clement declared that he would hand down the gospel mixed with heathen philosophy. But it remained for Origen, Clement's pupil, who mutilated himself to start the glorification of celibacy. Monasticism is not a product of Christianity. It was imported from non-Christian religions. Christians first saw it introduced in Egypt, evidently coming from Buddhism. There were two classes of monks. First, the Acharites sought to live alone in the gloomiest and wildest spots in the wilderness. 
The second class, monks evading the solitary life, gathering into communities called monasteries. Refusing obedience to any spiritual superior except the supreme head of the church, they placed at the command of the papacy a vast mobile army of men, not responsible to any congregation. Let it be remembered that the Bible training schools of the Celtic and Syrian Christianities were not monasteries of this kind, although there, were, there are writers who would have it so. The inmates of the monasteries had a different program from the Bible training schools, whose pupils were there. The monasteries had a different program from the Bible training schools who pupil, whose pupils were there. Not for life, but for a period of training, as the youth of today leaves home for four years in college. The monks at certain times had pageantries, prostrations, and genuflexations. All of these externals were symptoms of a growing ecclesiastical system, and they helped prepare the way for the union of the papal church with the state. Nevertheless, these and other departures from the New Testament Christianity stirred deeply in all lands those who were to become leaders against the new perversions and who would demand a return to the law and to, to the law and to the testimony. The Forerunners of Vigilantius. The splendid city of Milan in northern Italy was, connect, was the connecting link between Celtic Christianity in the west and Syrian Christianity in the east. The missionaries from the early churches in Judea and Syria securely stamped upon the religion around Milan the simple and ap apostolic religion. Milan was the rendezvous of numerous councils of clergy from the east, so that the early liturgies of Antioch, Milan, and Gaul were practically identical. It is impossible to find a time throughout the countries when there was not opposition in northern Italy to the Roman hierarchy. Sometimes great sometimes small, but always evangelical. Dr. Alex states this fact thus. To this purpose, it will be used to set forth, as well as the, co the constitution of the church, as in the manner in which the diocese of Milan did continue independent until the midst of the 11th century, at which time the Waldenses were obliged more openly to testify their aversion for the Church of Rome as an anti-Christian church. It will be easily enough for me to perform what I have proposed to myself in following the history of the church. Before the Council of Nicaea, we find the Diocese of Italy very distinct from that of Rome. Dr. Faber presents in the following words one way in which this gulf between the churches of the Milan district and Rome originated. Now this district on the eastern side of the Kantian Alps is the precise country of the Waldenses. Hither their, their ancestors retired during the persecutions of the 2nd and 3rd and 4th centuries. Here, providentially secluded from the world, they retained the precise doctrines and practices of the primitive church endeared to them by suffering and exile. While the wealthy inhabitants of the city in fertile plains, corrupted by a now opulent and gorgeous and powerful clergy, were daily sinking deeper and deeper into that apostasy, which has been so graphically foretold by the great apostle. Opponents of Pagan Practices First among those who protested against heathen, heathen practices in the church was Helvidius, A.D. 250 to 420. It is interesting to note that three of the outstanding opponents of the papal innovations in Latin Christianity were from northern Italy. These were Hel Helvidius, Jovanian and Vigilantius. As for Helvidius, all that was written by him and for him has been destroyed, though he lived a century and a half after Justin Martyr, and more than a century after Tertullian, Cyprian, Origen, and Clement, their writings have been preserved, while his were destroyed. Helvidius belonged to the church, which strove to hand down the doctrines of the Bible in pure form. He is famous for his exposure of Jerome for using corrupted Greek manuscripts in bringing out the Vulgate, the Latin Bible of the papacy. If the thunders of Jerome had not been turned against Hel Helvidius, we would have known less concerning him. Helvidius, a so-called her 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 heresiarch of the 4th century, a layman who opposed the growing superstitions of the church, he was a pupil of... Accentius, Bishop of Milan, and the precursor of Jovinian. 
Ducentia points out that Oxentius, for twenty years at the head of the Diocese of Milan, was from Asia Minor and impressed upon those regions the Syrian leadership in Christianity. Daring in his scholarship, Helvidius accused Jerome, as Jerome himself admits, of using corrupt Greek manuscripts. That part of the ecclesiastical system of the 4th century, which was particularly ascetic and rigid, found an impersonation in Jerome, who exhibited its worst and most repulsive traits in the whole tenor of his life and conversation. Sourness, bitterness, envy, intolerance, and dissatisfaction with every manifestation of sanctity, which did not come up to his own standard, had become habitual to him and were betrayed in almost everything he wrote, said, or did. Censoriousness and the spirit of invective were amongst his most strongly marked failings, and the very best men of the age did not escape his censure. The second renowned reformer of northern Italy and forerunner of Vigilantius was Jovinian, A.D. 330 to 390. He was so superior in scholarship that the united attempts of such learned advocates of the papacy as Jerome, Augustine, Augustine, and Ambrose failed to overthrow his scriptural and historical arguments. Of him, Albert H. Newman says that the protest of Jovinian, Jovinianus was awakened great influence and received influential support is evident from the expl expletive polemics of Jerome and from the public proceedings that were instituted against him in Rome and Milan. The persistence, uh, the persistence of the influence of Jovinaeus is seen in the movement led by Vigilantius. It is not likely that the followers of Jovinaeus, Jovinaeus took refuge in the Alpine valleys, and there kept alive the evangelic teaching that was to reappear with vigor in the 12th century. Buzart relates how a learned French historian speaks of re the relentless persecution carried on as late as 1215 by monks against so-called heretics named Jovenanist, Paternis, and Albigenses. Jovenian drew the wrath of Jerome because he taught that the lives of all married he taught that the lives of married people, all other things being equal, are as fully acceptable in the sight of God as those who are not married that eating with thanksgiving is as commendable with God as abstinenceness, and that all who are faithful to their baptismal vows will be equally rewarded on the day of judgment. Because of this, Jerome said that Jovinian had the hissing of the old serpent, nauseating trash, and the devil's poisonous concoction. Vigilantius was convinced that the new system of austerities, processions, and sacraments did not result in making men preeminently happy and holy. Vigilantius witnessed too many of the ecclesiastical riots in his day. When Damasus was elected pope in A.D. 366, the dissensions in Rome were so violent that the gates of the basilica where his rival was consecrated were broken open, the roof torn off, the building set afire, and 138-37 persons were killed. Similar ecclesiastical riots were seen in this time in Palestine. Jerome, in one of his epistles, declares that their private quarrels were as furious as, as, as were those of the barbarians. What caused the rupture between Vigilantius and Rome? When Vigilantius returned to Sulpicius, his employer, he stood at the parting of the ways. On the one hand, there was Martin, the Bishop of Tours, rushing from the cave to the cell in the excitement of supposed miracles. There was Sulpicius, turning from the sound scholarship of fab to fables and visions, and the gentle Paulinus of Nola was, gre was groveling before the image of a favorite saint, the victim of delusions. On the other hand, there was Helvidius, challenging the corrupt manuscript in the hands of Jerome, the Bishop of Rome, and their followers. There was a gr the great leader, Jovinian, defending the gospel simplicity and a married clergy. The event which decided Vigilantius was his visit to Jerome. By this time, the Goths, Celts, and Franks had forgotten their days of invasion and their religious differences and were being united by the invisible bonds of community life. 
They prized their Latin Bible, not the Latin Bible of Jerome, and generally called it Itala because it was read publicly in all the churches of Italy, France, Spain, Africa, and Germany, where Latin was understood, and Vetus on account of it being more ancient than any of the rest. To supplant this noble version, Jerome, at the request of the Pope and with money furnished by him, brought out a new Latin Bible. He was looked up to by the imperial church as the oracle of his age. Vigilantius, having inherited his father's wealth and desiring to consult Jerome, determined to visit him in his cell at Bethlehem. He went by way of Italy, paying a second visit to Paulinius. While he was there, processions to the tomb of the saint were made, accompanied by the swinging of incense and the carrying of lighted tapers. But Vigilantius said nothing. The gentle manners of Sulpicius and Paulinus, coupled with their meek devotion, softened their delusions. When, however, he encountered the fierce polemics of Jerome, the eyes of the Gallic reformer were open. Vigilantius, AD 396, was the bearer of a letter from Paulinus to Jerome, and this was the introduction which m made him personally acquainted with the most extraordinary man of that age. Jerome was the terror of his contemporaries, the man above all others, who, in a mistaken attempt to do his duty to God, failed most signally in his duty towards men, unmindful of the apostles' words. If a man say, I love God, and hated his brother, he is a liar. The mortification of the flesh had tended to puff up his spirit, and of all the polemic writers of the fourth century, he was the most bitter and severe. The first meeting of Vigilantius with Jerome at Bethlehem is described in this language. A narrow bypath leading off from the street at the spot where the tomb of the king Archelaus formerly stood conducted the traveler to the cell of Jerome. Here he found the ascetic clad in a vestment so coarse and sordid that its very vileness bore the stamp of spiritual, spiritual pride and seemed to say, Stand off, my wearer is holier than thou. The face of the monk was pale and haggard. He had been slowly recovering from a severe illness and was wasted to a shadow. Frequent tears had plowed his cheeks with deep furrows and his eyes were sunken in their sockets. All the bones on his face were sharp and projecting. Long fasting, habitual mortification, and the chagrin which perpetual disp disputation occasions had given an air of gloominess to his countenance, which accorded but ill with his boast, that his cell was to him like an arbor in the Garden of Eden. Vigilantius was at first warmly received by Jerome. The scenes at Bethlehem were the same as he had witnessed in the estates of his friends, who had been drawn into the tithe of asceticism. The sourness of temper and the fierce invectives of the editor of the Vulgate began to raise doubts in the mind of Vigilantius, however, as to the value of the whole system. The Gaelic presbyter was especially incensed at Jerome's criticism of Palinaeus. But it was when Jerome turned fiercely upon Rufinius, his former friend, that the break between Vigilantius and Jerome took place. Vigilantius left Bethlehem to find Rufinus at Jerusalem. There was nothing in the life and atmosphere of that ancient city to encourage the visitor from southern France. He learned enough from his interview with Rufinus to recoil from Jerome's leadership and to discover the first protest arising in his heart against the new system of asceticism and monasticism. He returned from Jerusalem to Bethlehem fully determined to protest against the unchristian vagaries of the month whom few dared to oppose. As a result of this encounter, Vigilantius resolved to quit for good the contentious successors of the Alexandrian school because of their loose theology and because they associated with the swarms of Egyptian monks. He determined to raise his voice in defense of the gospel's primitive simplicity. Another incident occurred to strengthen his resolution. He revisited Nola, Italy, returning by way of Egypt. One can imagine his indignation when he learned that Jerome was not satisfied with all of the humiliations and sufferings Paulinus had undergone to conform to asceticism, but had written a taunting demand that his friends surrender all his wealth immediately. Then Vigilantius decided to break the silence. How and where and against what we learn from Jerome's reply to Reprarius, 
a priest of southern France to whom, about A.D. 404, Jerome wrote the following concerning Vilantius. I have myself before now seen the monster, and have done my best to bind the mani maniac with text of scripture, as, Hippocrate as Hippocrates binds his patients with chains. But he went away, he departed, he escaped, he broke out, and taking refuge between the Adriatic and the Alps of King Cotius, declaimed in his turn against me. In the Cotian Alps, in the region lying between the Alps and the Adriatic Sea, Vigilantius first began the public efforts to stop the pagan ceremonies that were being baptized into the church. Why did he choose that region? Because there he found himself among people who adhered to the teachings of scriptures. They had removed to those valleys to escape the armies of Rome. He was perhaps aware that he would find in the Caltian Alps a race of people who were opposed to the notions of celibacy and vows of continence which formed the favorite dogma of Jerome and was at the bottom of all of his ascetic austerities. How fruitful were the endeavors of Vigilantis may be seen in the following, taken from another letter of Jerome to Reparius. Shameful to relate, the, uh, there are bishops who are said to be associated with him in his wickedness, if at least they are to be called bishops, who ordain no deacons but such as been previously married. It is not known whether the bishops who were agreeing with Vigilantius in his crusade against the semi-pagan Christianity of his day were on the Italian or the French side of the Alps. It matters little as far as Jer it, it matters little as far as Jerome was concerned. Since the preaching of Vigilantius on both sides of the mountains produced a thundering denunciation of Jerome, the great champion of the church state that were heard all the way across the Mediterranean from Bethlehem. Thus the new mission of Vigilantius has created a cleavage between those elected to walk in the apostolic way and those who gave the church development as a reason for adding pagan ceremonies to the glamour of the state gorgeousness. The New Organization of Free Churches The Alpine churches of France and Italy were not swept into the new hysteria. They welcomed Vigilantius with open arms, and his preaching was powerful. He makes his raid upon the churches of Gaul. He makes his raid upon the churches of Gaul, cried out Jerome. Those in, south of the, Fran in the south of France who desired the new teachings appealed to Jerome to defend the innovations against the attacks of Vigil Vigilantius. Jerome's reply, addressed to Reparius, reveals that doctrines and practices the Gaelic former was denouncing church celibacy, worship of relics, lighted tapers, all light vigils, and prayers to the dead. Again and again, Jerome begged to have sent to him the book which Vigilantius wrote. The historian Milner has exclaimed, For a single page of Jovinius or Vigilantius, I would gladly give up the whole invectives of Jerome. The new leader of the churches, which had not united with the state, spent his fortune in collecting manuscripts, circulating the scriptures, and employing Amanuenses to write pamphlets, tracts, and books. Jerome demanded that he be delivered over to the state for banishment or death, and as historians and the decrees of popes point out, the, the state church, when seeking the life of opponents, turned them over to the secular tribunal for punishment. This was done in order to disguise their crime. The, wreckish, the, the wretch's tongue should be cut out, or he should be put under treatment for insanity, wrote Jerome. Thus the ecclesiastical leaders, supported by the state polities of power, were abandoning the persuasion of love for brutal argument of force. In spite of all those, this, those in the regions under the consideration were determined to follow the Bible only. They were growing in strength and were coming closer together. Under the impetus of the campaigns of Vigilantius, a new organization was being created, destined to persist through the coming centuries. Vigilantius had prepared for himself for the, this throughout the years by giving days and nights to study and research. It is a regrettable fact that none of his writings have been preserved. How demoralizing the influence of the mon monastic hysteria was may be seen in the transformation wrought in Augustine, AD 354 to 430. This renowned writer of the church, probably of all Catholic fathers and the most adored by the papacy, was forced by the popular pressure into views of Jerome 
and was in correspondence with him. His complete surrender to the policy of persecution is given at length by Limborich. Augustine, from his episcopal throne in Af North Africa, gave to the papacy a deadly weapon. He invented the monstrous doctrine of compel them to come in. Thus, he laid the foundation for the Inquisition. Intoxicated with Greek philosophy, he cried out that its spirit, it, that its spirit filled its soul with incredible fire. He had wandered nine long years in Machinasium, which taught that the union of church and state and the exalted and exalted the observance of the first day of the week. Augustine founded many reasons why the doctrines and practices of the church should be enforced by the sword. The doctrine compelled them to come in, sent millions to death for no greater crime than refusing to believe in the forms of ecclesiastical worship enforced by the state. Such was the atmosphere of the age in which Vigilantius ministered. In his day, another controversy existed which was to rock the Christian world. Milan, the center of northern Italy, as well as all the eastern churches, was sanctifying the seventh-day Sabbath, while Rome was requiring his followers to fast on that day in an effort to discredit it. Interesting pictures of the conflict are given by an eminent scholar and writer, Dr. Peter Halen. Ambrose, the celebrated bishop of Milan, and Augustine, the more celebrated bishop of Africa, both contemporaries of Vigilantius, described the interesting situation. Ambrose said that when he was in Milan he observed Saturday, but when in Rome he fasted on Saturday and observed Sunday. This gave rise to the proverb, when you are in Rome, do as Rome does. Ra Augustine deplored the fact that the two, that in two neighboring churches in Africa, one observed the seventh-day Sabbath and another fasted on it. Vigilantius has been called the forerunner of the Reformation, one of the earliest of our Protestant forefathers. Although the practices against which he invaded continued for hundreds of years, yet the influence of his preaching and leadership among the Waldenses burned its way across the centuries until it united with the heroic, heroic forms of Luther. As the papacy promoted persecutions from time to time against the Waldenses, it proclaimed the heresy of these regions as being the same brand as that of Vigilantius. Two centuries later, medieval writers leveled their attacks against Claude, Bishop of Milan, and his followers on the basis that he was infected with the poison of Vigilantius. From the days of the Gaelic reformer on, multiplied churches of northern Italy and southern France bore entirely a different color from that which rested upon the legal ecclesiasticism. Thus, Vigilantius in southern Europe, like his contemporary Patrick of Ireland, can be counted on, counted as one of the early bright stars of the church of, in the wilderness. The following are the sub... are the words are the sentences in the bottom of each page that were not read. Jerome against Vigilantius, found in Nicene and the post-Nicene Fathers. Jerome here states that Vigilantius was born in Convenay, southern Gaul. This uh, city also bore the name Lyons, whose pronunciation is like the English word Leo. Obviously, therefore, he would be called Vigilantius the Leonist. The Waldenses are often called the Leonis. It has been concluded, therefore, that the appellation Leonis is derived from Vigilantius. McClintock and Strong, Cyclopedia Art. Helvidius. The statement that Helvidius was the pupil of Oxentius opens up wide considerations. When we remember that Ambrose was the successor of Oxentius in the bishopric of Milan, Ambrose sanctified the seventh day as the Sabbath, as he himself says. Ambrose had great influence in Spain, which was also observing the seventh, the seventh Sabbath, the Saturday Sabbath, as we will show later. It was Ambrose who recorded with rejoicing the surprising, the, super, the supervising trip of the illustrious leader of Abyssinia, Bishop Musan, and Abyssinia observed the Sabbath for 1700 years, who toured the churches of India and China. Since Helvidius and Vigilantes were practically contemporaneous and preachers of the same message, 
it is safe to conclude that Oxentius, Ambrose, Helvidius, and Vigilantius were Sabbath keepers. These facts link together Spain, Northern Italy, Abyssinia, India, Central Asia, and China in Sabbath keeping. All the foregoing events occurred close to AD 400. It is interesting to note that Pope Innocent I, within 15 years after this date, passed a law which required fasting on Saturday in order to brand its sacredness with austerity instead of joy. To those who will be listening to this recording, to this recording I must offer a brief apology about the pronunciation of the, some of the words in this chapter and in this book. There are some words I have never seen before. However, it does not detract from how amazingly interesting this book is. Thank you.